Here's Johnny. This is some scary movie. You like scary movies? Uh huh. What's your favorite scary movie? Uh, I don't know. Clear! Clear! Those are some classic horror movie sounds that'll instantly send shivers up your spine. You've probably heard them before, even if you can't quite remember where. Never fear, we'll only keep you in suspense about where they're from until the end of the episode. I'm Natasha Gorgiulo, and this is Hello Movies. Today, we're taking a stab at the genre of horror. Once seen as lowbrow and low-budget, it's emerged as a highly bankable bet at the box office. We're going to slice that idea up a bit by taking a look at three movies released this month. Joining me to bite into all of this is Alexandra West. Alex is the host of the Faculty of Horror podcast and the author of two books examining horror movies. Let's get right into it with Blumhouse's Fantasy Island. Good evening. I'm Mr. Rurik. Let me officially welcome you to... Fantasy Island. Oh my God, that's really her. So a lot of people will remember this classic show that ran in the late 70s, early 80s called Fantasy Island, where people arrived on a mysterious island to have their fantasies fulfilled, but not always in the way they expected. This movie version is a lot darker by the sounds of it. Alex, what do you think? Yeah, two things struck me as soon as I heard about it. IP or intellectual property is really the name of the game for any production house, any producer right now. If you want to get something made, it really helps to have a notable property. And, you know, for me, I was born in the mid 80s, but I have a vague sense of what Fantasy Island is. Um, I I know it was a thing. I know it was a TV show. Uh, This is the new version of it, the film version of it. And the other thing that struck me about it was the fact that it's titled Blumhouse's Fantasy Island. And I think Blumhouse in the last few years has really come to uh, be the linchpin in the horror genre in terms of big studio or big production house that is really leading the way in terms of horror. And this, uh, for me, even though they were doing some really great horror films before it, it really started for them with Get Out, and uh, which was released in um, 2016, 2017. And uh, so now they have enough name recognition within the genre or within their audience to be able to say Blumhouse. I understand now Blumhouse means horror often. So this is going to be like a spooky fantasy island. Um, I'm very curious to see it. I'm very curious to see what the response to it will be. We'll see. Alex, you've made a career out of watching horror movies. Why do you love the genre so much? Yeah, I think horror, it's always trying to play with the visceral part of ourselves, whether it's a visceral part of our own emotional humanity or the visceral part of our physicality. And they're the taboo subjects that we don't often get to touch on or talk about. So when we go and we experience these films, they can sometimes feel really subversive and really scary and really weird. But um, oftentimes they're a lot of fun. They feel a bit naughty, a bit transgressive, and you get a lot of fun out of them as well as being, um, you know, feeling really human in many ways. So there's just so much going on and it demands so much of us as an audience yeah. member, I think, that I think that's why people really respond to it and return to it again. And again. You mentioned that Blumhouse produced Get Out, so talk to me a bit about its trajectory as a studio. Blumhouse started off very small. I mean, they, uh, Jason Blum, the founder of it, kind of started with the paranormal activity films, and it just kept growing. They were incredible incredibly profitable. And they kept growing and they kept trading on horror. They knew horror. They they were trying all these different things. Um, and, and oftentimes they were really successful, you know, doing something like Insidious, you know, and numerous other films, picking up other films that, you know, had been made, but the distribution fell through. So they were releasing them or at least finding them a home in many ways. And then, you know, if we look at kind of what happened at the release of Get Out, I mean, that 
that truly changed the horror game. I, I really believe um, that as you know, a horror critic, a horror journalist, however you want to call me, um, we will continue to talk about the time before Get Out and then after Get Out. The same way we talk about, you know, there was a time before Night of the Living Dead and there's a time after Night of the Living Dead. Um, and what I think Blumhouse is continuing to do is in many ways they are really speaking to the teen audience that wants to play in horror, that wants to dabble in it. It, but they're also keeping a toe in the kind of more adult, the more intellectual, the more accessibly intellectual horror film and playing to that kind of elevated horror that people like to wring their hands over. But Blumhouse is kind of doing it all. And just to jump in for a sec, speaking of doing it all, Blumhouse is also behind the new film Invisible Man starring Elizabeth Moss. I found something that can prove what I'm experiencing. You need help. Adrian is dead. I went to his house today. He's not dead. I have a pile of ashes in a box that would disagree with you. He has figured out a way to be invisible. Only thing more brilliant than inventing something that makes you invisible is coming up with the perfect way to torture you, even in death. Alex, what do we know so far about this film? So this version of The Invisible Man is obviously a take on the H.G. Wells character. This was a character that was first brought into film um, as part of what many consider to be the universal classic monsters. He's played by Claude Rains. And uh, now, you know, there's been a few different incarnations of it. This character has reappeared in popular culture over the decades because, you know, you say The Invisible Man, you kind of get it. You know, I think what not everyone is clued into is the fact that H.G. Wells always wrote this character as kind of evil. Like, he was not a good guy. Um, And now what we see is Blumhouse and taking that property and that theme and then shifting the perspective. So it's not necessarily about this doctor who's running around doing evil things and the men who go and chase him. It's about his seemingly ex-partner who is terrified of this abusive ex she has who has now seemingly left her all this money if she can prove she's not crazy. Um, And I think it's bringing up a lot of really interesting themes about believing women, um, the Me Too movement, abuse within intimate relationships, all under the banner of horror. You're listening to Hello Movies, brought to you by Cineplex. Before we continue digging into the characteristics of modern horror films and why you should go see them in theaters, we want to first encourage you to subscribe to Hello Movies wherever you get your podcasts. While you're at it, why not send us the name of your favorite scary movie on social media? Let's get a list going. We're at Cineplex Movies on Twitter and Instagram. We're back with horror movie journalist and author Alex West, and we're talking about how the new take on Invisible Man explores some bigger themes like abusive relationships. So what is it about the horror genre that maybe opens up this kind of storytelling? I think the public perceives horror to be able to tell that bigger story. So uh, I think directors and filmmakers and Uh, production houses are able to sell those through a bit more easily. But the horror genre has always done that. Like The Night of the Living Mm -hmm. Dead was never just about zombies. It was about the state of America uh, at the end of the 60s. Texas Chainsaw Massacre is about the collapse of capitalism. Um, Rosemary's Baby, uh, The Shining, um, the original Suspiria, the new Suspiria. Like, you know, I can go on and on. Even, you know, Halloween, Nightmare on Elm Street, these are all dealing with political issues that were happening at the time. It it deals, the horror genre deals with so much and it puts it at a life or death kind of parallel. I mean, it does deal often in the binary of it's going to be life or it's going to be death, which can seem very dramatic. Sometimes it can be a bit silly, but um, I, I think now audiences are more open to going to a horror film and seeing something. And I think now we're just at a place where the film industry, the audiences, the producers, everyone else is willing to take horror seriously. And I think we're going to see a lot of people capitalizing it, just like we have seen, um, you know, since just before Jordan Peele, but really since Jordan Peele kind of, you know, broke through in a really significant way. So, Alex, we've talked about horror films exploring deep social issues, but there's also something to be said for the fun in being scared out of your wits, right? That brings us to Brahms the Boy 2. The premise is that this family moves into a new home, unaware of its terrifying past. Then this young boy makes friends with an eerily lifelike doll named Brahms. 
You just know it's not gonna go well. Beware his story, one and all. Brahms was never just a doll. To live again, he needs a friend. His deadly rules will never end. What do you think, Alex? I, I might be one of the few who actually saw the original boy in theaters. And I did I, I did have a lot of fun with it. It's uh, it, kind of ridiculous. It's totally goofy. Had a cu- couple good jump scares. And I think we're going to get the same with this sequel. Uh, I think the really exciting part for me being a 90s kid is that Katie Holmes is in it. Uh, uh-huh. Very excited to see her in something. And honestly, in the trailer, it looks like she's having so much fun. I can't remember the last time I've seen her have fun. So... I'm super pumped for it. It looks like, I don't want to spoil the original, but it looks like they're taking the film in a different direction. And that's the one you get all your friends together. You get a big bag of popcorn and you go and you like scream and laugh and have a really good time with it at the theater. Okay, I'm glad you brought that up because a friend of mine jokes that she likes to watch horror movies in theaters because, well, then the monster has someone else to eat. So why do you say they're best enjoyed in a theater? I mean, you know, you've got a big screen so you can appreciate all the visuals. The sound is awesome. You're getting to hear every like creak and crack and you're just, your nerves are on edge. Um, the boy too is perfect for the popcorn, the screaming, the good time with your friends where you're kind of like, oh my gosh, what did we just watch? But then also I always think about uh, when I saw The Quiet Place in theaters and it was a packed house. It was packed on opening weekend and everyone was silent. We were all like, as a community, like we had all just somehow subconsciously agreed we were not going to mess this up. And everyone was super quiet throughout the whole thing. And it, it was, it was a blast. It's, it's horror is best experienced with a community and uh, you find a great community at the theater. Before I let you go, Alex, Parasite was a huge winner at the Oscars and Get Out, like you mentioned, was a landmark film. So where do you think horror is going as a genre? Uh, so I think what we're going to see is hopefully a move towards more original content. Um, Again, Jordan Peele created two films, completely original concepts um, that I think are really exciting and really new. Um, And I think we're going to see an increased push uh, towards international films. I think with Parasite winning so many Oscars, you know, the last week that we will see uh, a further emphasis on Asian film, like uh, Asian horror films are incredible. Um, And I think giving them a bit more of a platform, seeking them out, getting them wider distribution, not just, you know, straight to DVD or VOD, whatever it is now. Um, We're going to see some more international stuff. We're going to see less IP. Um, And I think hopefully, uh, because a lot of horror films do their tour on the festival circuit, I'm hoping we see some of those big, you know, exciting things that came through get picked up and get released in theaters. And we're starting to see that. So I hope that trend carries on because it's an incredible showcase. And, you know, as I always say, the best place to see horror is in the theater. And um, that's where you want it. That's where you're going to find your audience. That's where you're going to find your, your family, your horror family. Alex West is a horror movie expert and the host of the Faculty of Horror podcast. And now the moment you may have been waiting for. One of our resident movie critics, Marnie Wise, is here now to reveal the source of those scary sounds you heard off the top, as well as some other horror movie trivia you may not know. Marnie, welcome back. How, how are you? Let me start by asking how you are. I understand you've been talking a lot about horror today. <laughs> And you know, Marnie, this is my favorite type of film, right? This is my favorite genre because it just scares me to death. But I want to get your take on listening to those clips that we started the podcast with earlier on in the episode. Uh, Let's take a listen to these clips, starting with an easy one. Here's Johnny. (laughs) So, of course, that's. Jack Nicholson and Stanley Kubrick's 1980 classic, The Shining, which I think is my personal favorite horror movie. And Kubrick, who's famous for his obsessive attention to detail, shot the famous Here's Johnny scene over the course of three days and had to replace the splintered door 60 times. (gasps) You mean Jack Nicholson had to do that scene 60 times? He's a pro. All right. Our next scene is an oldie, but ooh, such a goodie. Okay, you probably know that one too. 
They will get harder. That is the famous <laughs> shower scene in Alfred Hitchcock's 1960 film Psycho. The now iconic score was written by Bernard Herrmann, and Hitchcock was so pleased with the end result that he doubled the composer's salary to just over $34,000. Remember, this was 1960. Mm. Hitchcock later said that 33% of the effect of Psycho was due to the music. Of course. And do you know, till this day, every time I check into a hotel room and I take a shower... I constantly hear that song whenever I take a shower. And I'm constantly worried that there's going to be somebody on the other side of that shower curtain. Natasha, I feel for you. That's terrible. (laughs) You have to get over that. Maybe watch the film one more time with all the lights on and surrounded by friends, and then you'll be okay. I'll do some scary movie. You like scary movies? Uh Uh-huh. What's your favorite scary movie? Uh, I don't know. Okay, that clip is from the opening scene of the 1996 slasher film Scream. Drew Barrymore, whose character Casey meets an early demise in the film, was originally cast as Sidney Prescott, the character played by Nev Campbell. But Drew insisted that if she played Casey, who dies in the first few minutes of the movie, then it would make audiences realize, wow, anything can happen. Any character can go at any moment. Marnie, did you just spoil Scream for people who've never Mm. seen it? Look, this movie came out in 1996. If people haven't seen it by now, they're on their own. And she dies in the first few minutes. It's not like it ruins past the first 10 minutes of the movie. All right, our clips are going to start getting a little more difficult to recognize. Take a listen to this. So that eerie croak is from Takashi Shimuzu's 2004 supernatural horror, The Grudge, which was itself an American remake of his own 2002 Japanese version. The Grudge, of course, has gone on to spawn a huge horror franchise, which was just re-rebooted uh, last month with uh, John Cho in one of the lead roles. Yeah, and people just can't seem to get enough of the grudge. All right, we've come to our final movie. It's a horror clip that might be a little tricky for some to guess, but it's become a cult classic. Mm-hmm. Clear! Clear. Clear. Ah! Anybody who got this one gets an extra 10 points and a gold star. So this creepy sound is the infamous defibrillator scene from John Carpenter's sci-fi horror, The Thing. (laughs) This movie, which horror master Carpenter has said is his favorite of all of his films, was a big box office disappointment when it was released in 1982. And the film's producers blamed that on its horrific depiction of an alien life form which was contrasted against Steven Spielberg's feel-good E.T., The Extraterrestrial, which had just come out a few weeks earlier. The film, however, as you mentioned, has since achieved a major cult following. I have to tell you, I googled that scene because I've never seen this film before. And again, I was traumatized. So whether... (laughs) Yeah, well, if you you were scared by the sound, then the visuals are really going to creep you out. I encourage everybody to google that scene. Marnie, it is always such a pleasure to have you on Hello Movies. Before I let you go, though, I want to ask you about some movies coming out this week and what particular ones you're excited for. Okay, we've got two that are counter-programming to horror movies. Both of them come out on February 21st. The first one is Emma, based on the Jane Austen novel. So we've got Anya Taylor-Joy, who you may have seen in The Witch or Split. She's playing Emma Woodhouse, who is a high society girl in 1800s England who wants to be a matchmaker but ends up just meddling in and messing up everybody else's life. Also, this one is uh, directed by Autumn DeWilde, who you probably haven't heard of because up until now, she's mostly done music videos, including a bunch by Beck. So expect this one to be pretty stylish. And also, the reviews are already out. And uh, last time I looked, it was at about 95% on uh, Rotten Tomatoes. Oh, I think I will check that one out. Thanks, Marnie. Do you have another one? Yep. The other one is The Call of the Wild, also February 21st. And that, of course, is based on the classic Jack London novel, which was published in 1903. This is a dog movie. So if you're a dog person, Mm -hmm. get your tickets now. Um, The story is really about the dog. He's stolen 
and sold as a sled dog transported up north to the Yukon, where he lives a pretty tough life. He's abused. He goes through a number of owners until he lands mm. with grumpy old John Thornton, who is played by grumpy old Harrison Ford. <laughs> so Thornton is a gold prospector. This is during the Klondike Gold Rush of the 1890s. And Thornton and his dog Buck go off on this great adventure. And, um, you know, they just they bond with each other the way that neither of them has bonded with anyone else. And uh, this one, too, has been done a few times in the past. There was a Clark Gable version in 1935, a Charlton Heston version in 1972. And now we have Harrison Ford's version. Marnie, I love it. There are two classic novels and two great films that everyone can see this week in the theater. Thank you. Maybe you can alternate horror classic. Or just to give yourself a breather in between. That's it for this episode of Hello Movies, brought to you by Cineplex. We hope you enjoyed sinking your teeth into some of the meaty issues involved in horror movies. Blumhouse's Fantasy Island is in Cineplex theaters now, Brahms The Boy 2 on February 21st, and The Invisible Man on February 28th. See you again in two weeks when we take a look at movies that explore the theme of memory. I'm Natasha Gargiulo. See you next time.